This video is a continuation of the Dawn of the Chosen story. The first part of this video series goes over the first chapter of the campaign, The Crystal Feather, which you can also find as a playable scenario on the Storyteller's Vault. It contains basic information about the settings, some new artifacts with evocations, as well as a short adventure for young exalts. This video is the third part of the second chapter of the campaign, The Everliving. Once I've made videos for the entire story, I'll probably make a playable scenario to this one as well. In the previous episode, the Solars Carmen, Jinray and Riani went to Magister General Weather Milward's estate only to find it covered in flames. As they went in to look for survivors, the group split up to cover more ground. Carmen and Riani went upstairs where they encountered a demon, and Jinray went downstairs where he was ambushed by creatures made of shadow and malice. Carmen and Riani managed to defeat the demon, but Jinrai was subsumed into his own anima and disappeared, leaving only some bloodstains behind. Even though Jinrai was missing, the plan to disguise Carmen as nobility went forward. A few hours after the events at the manor, she had been bathed and perfumed, her hair had been combed and her nails had been polished. Rihanna was there as well, watching as Carmen struggled with the energetic servants. Ow! Ow! Carmen exclaimed, her hair tuggled into curlers. She wanted to suck the girl jerking on it, but two burly old broads were holding her arms stiff to either side while two others lacquered and painted the nails. Does this shit, does it wash off? She looked worried before one of the big women grasped her jaw and forced her to purse her lips for the lipstick brush. No swearing, one of them said. And keep your back straight, and don't clench your fist. You should let your fingers sprout like flower petals. Carmen growled deep in her throat at the woman who lectured her, but she did as told, holding her fingers out in wide petals. She smacked her lips and bulged her eyes in outrage as one of the servants pressed a napkin to her lips firmly to strip off the excess lipstick. And you're done, take a look in the mirror. Carmen turned to look in the mirror, preparing to launch into a tirade when she looked into the polished glass and saw a stranger looking back. Carmen had always had a hard face and a perpetual scowl that was darkened by thick brooding brows. She had messy, uncombed hair that was hacked at the shoulder with a skinning knife. She wore leathers and wool dyed black, patched in a dozen different places. This woman though, this girl in the mirror, she had none of that. Her face was elegantly made up with a brujanda lipstick to set off her olive skin and a small painted shape on the right cheek to draw the eye like a beauty mark. Her hair was combed, washed and plaited, held together with golden bands and an elaborate headdress. Even her piercing black eyes were softened by the way her brows had been tapered and sculpted. Finally, the armor was gone entirely, replaced by an elegantly woven blue dress embroidered with geometric shapes and ending just above her bust to show off her strong shoulders. It was cinched tightly around her waist with a sash and a two-piece jacket set on a clothes stand to the side. Oh, she said in a small voice, feeling a welter of confused emotions rising even as she ran her hands over the smooth fabric. I don't think Rosalian women dress this way. Usually they don't, Rihanna said. Fortunately, when you're absurdly rich and powerful, you tend to collect a fair portion of exotic wear. You have the features of someone from further in the east proper, so they want that for you. Carmen nodded. I guess that makes sense. She fidgeted nervously where she stood, picking at the underside of her sash. I'm here to pick up my date, said a voice from the open door. But I can tell that I'm a bit early. 
At the door stood a well-kept man dressed in a fine vest of crimson velvet over a snow-white shirt ornamented with golden cufflinks. The Millward crest was embroidered over his heart and from his black leather belt was sheathed a fine sword that indicated his position as one of the steel vanguard. His face was both youthful and fair while also carrying a pale stubble and slightly ruffled platinum hair. As he noticed Carmen, he bowed before her and kissed her hand. My name is Auden Millward, Knight Captain of the Steel Vanguard and firstborn son to Magister General Vidar Millward. I'm here to escort you to the Silver Falcon as your date. Normally, Carmen might have whistled or given him a leering over, but at this moment, feeling strange as she was, she nodded and grinned dumbly caught up in his shimmering blue eyes. Hello, I mean, greetings, I'm Carmen Melroth. Helping your father, that is, I'm helping your father, we're working together. It's very brave what you're doing. Your dress looks lovely, by the way. Oh, does it? She laughed weakly. I'm no judge of these things, but thank you. You have a fine garb yourself and a fine blade as well. Odin pulled the sword out of his sheath in one smooth move. It's been forged by Elder Ten of the Mountain, using their rarest black steel. It's also coated with a special oil of my father's making, so that I can easily lit it aflame should those shadow monsters show up. He balanced the blade and hilt over his hand and offered it to Carmen, who picked it up and twirled it in her fingers, her lips splitting in a brajanda grin. She danced the hilt around like a coin between her fingers and held it back towards him. It's gorgeous, she said. Thanks for showing it to me. She cuffed and smoothed her dress. So, you understand everything that's happened so far? We're facing a nasty bugger and if we don't succeed, the whole city might go under. Odin sheathed the sword and offered Carmen his arm. She took it with an undisguised grin, enjoying both how her new look made her feel and what others would think about her when they saw her on his arm. A part of her wanted to spit or fart or do something to spoil the mood and let everyone know she was still capable of kicking their asses, but a much larger part of her wanted to enjoy every second she had with a gorgeous soldier even if they were just doing a job. My father has filled me in about everything, he explained as they walked. He told me about Wilkas the Red, the demon and the killer. He didn't seem to have connected the dots, but I believe the killer we're looking for is a woman. When father showed me the letters, I noticed that this Wilkas person mentioned a daughter in one of them. I think that could be the person we're looking for. Whoever she is, she's no much for Yanni. Carmen and Auden took a carriage down through the Royal Courtyard, Rose Gate, Altar and Square and down Herring Road to the Silver Falcon. The Silver Falcon was a massive building and Carmen could hear how round it was inside. The large and well-carved wooden sign above the main door said in sky tongue, Karom's Rith Silver Falcon. In a smaller text underneath was the name translated to River Speak as well as Flame Tongue. Auden explained that this Karom Serithirath was a southerner from the lands of hot sandy dunes and that he was wealthy enough to have established silver falcons across half the world. This was the only restaurant in Jilali that served fresh cuisine from other parts of creation. When they went inside and entered the main hall, Karma got a sense of familiarity as she had been to many taverns in the past that were full of rowdy guests who were singing, drinking, gambling, but unlike the other taverns she'd been to, the Silver Falcon's main hall was large and it was so crowded that she couldn't help but wonder exactly where they could possibly keep all the kegs and food stuff for so many people. Auden held Carmen's hand as he led her through the masses towards the area in the back. A number of people recognized him and a drunk friend came to put his arm around him. Hey Auden, I'd never seen you on a date before. <laughs> Very funny, Auden said and gently pushed his friend back. This is Lady Carmen of Alba Silva. Lady Carmen, this is Knight Lieutenant Gren Wildmark. <laughs> the drunken friend kept laughing. Stay here, I'll get drinks. The moment Gren had pushed himself away towards the bar, Auden's grip around Carmen's hand tightened. Let's go before he comes back. He led her to the bar at the back door where he nodded to the bartender who nodded back. Moments later, a waiter opened the door to a closed off back area of the restaurant where it was more quiet, with only a few groups of people sitting by themselves in corners far from each other, enjoying massive meals with all kinds of food Carmen had never seen before. The waiter led them to an area where they had a good view over the room, but the rest of the room could hardly see them. Three cushioned divans were placed around an oaken table with scented candles. Auden waited for Carmen to take a seat before he sat down himself, and then the waiter gave them each a menu that was written in three languages and had a detailed illustration of each meal. 
Carmen was practically drunk already as of the rich sense of this place. There were the usual foul smells surrounding so many people in such a small area, but there were others too, wines, beers and liquors from all over the world, fresh shops of meat raw being seasoned and cooked, endless spices and condiments, even the building smelled nice cedar and oak in the common room, then beech, rosewood, ironwood and even more exotic trees from the far east she had never encountered before. And the meals, even the soup being supped by the heavy man in the corner was making her mouth water. You're the veteran, Carmen said to Olin. What's the protocol here, what's good? Well, a standard dinner here is either 5, 6, 8, 10, 12 or 16 courses. There's also 12 hour long 21 course meal. I haven't done more than 6 courses myself though and we probably shouldn't drink too much since we have a killer to catch. The seafood is really good. How about we open with a seared scallop of muse, then have the crab soup followed by the broiled lobster tail entree and the marinated wild salmon as main before we ease down with the white truffle and then finish off with the lime tart. The white wine goes well with all courses. Carmen stared at him incredulously before looking around the room again. She took a deep breath. So, she said, you know what I am, yeah? Orden's smile dropped for a moment. Yes, my father told me. And you're not afraid? Afraid? Nah. I've heard of how helpful you've been to my father. I don't think I'll regret putting my trust in you. He smiled. I've also heard that you have a really keen sense of smell, so I'll do my best not to fart. Ha! <laughs> she barked, finally meeting his eyes again. You're not quite like most posh types, not so quick to judge. Odin smiled again, but it then faded again. He looked at her, eyes sharp. This Wilkas the Red has killed my half-sister. He's killed dozens of people working in my estate and he's killed a handful of my brethren in the order. He's threatening the city that's my home, that I love. I want to see this through. Carmen sighed. I'm not good at all this nobility stuff, Odin, but if there's something I'm good at, it's finding something and killing it. I promise you this, either it is or I do. When twilight came, Jin Ryder Potter emerged into existence. His body was still sore from the beating since it felt to him like it had happened only a moment ago. He looked around himself to take in the scene and noticed that he hadn't appeared in the temple as he had assumed. He was still underground, though in a huge chamber of the catacombs. Jin Ryder knew that the catacombs covered most of the old town's underground and they even stretched beyond that. Some of the chambers were larger than others, there was no way of knowing exactly where he was. In the center of the room was a large mandala with a seven-pointed star drawn on the floor with blood. At three of the star's points were human hearts in silver bowls. The faint moans of zombies and the rattling of skeletons echoed throughout the chamber and Jinrai noticed the undead keeping guard at the exits and roaming around the room. None of them showed an indication of wanting to attack him. I assume you thought the place of power you'd end up in would be the temple, am I correct? The voice came from a good distance away. A kid in a mountain man robe was sitting on top of a closed sarcophagus. He held an obsidian scepter in his hand, gently tapping it against his thigh. An obsidian box with intricate carvings hanged from his belt. Sitting at his feet below the sarcophagus was the shadow abomination Jin had been facing in Billward Manor. Jin the Potter, please make yourself comfortable. I intend for you to be the witness of a becoming, but first I would like you to give me the Susano. Jinrai's lip curled in anger at the sight of his enemy. The idea of Wilkas even touching the Susano was galling. You know, I'm not going to do that, he said. After all, if I give it to you, how am I supposed to take your head off with it? Your Susano can't kill me. Wilkas jumped down from the sarcophagus and walked up to Jinrai until it was close enough to be cut. The shadow monster growled, but it didn't move. Now Wilkas was standing before Jinrai with only Susan in between. He held up his hand before its edge and then pressed forward, letting the blade pierce his hand. He didn't react to any pain and he spilled no blood. He continued to push forward until his hand was close enough to grab the hilt. Jinrai felt the boy's fingers brush against his hand holding the blade and he felt that they were cold. 
I am immortal, the boy said, but the Solar Exalted can still die. Oh, immortal things can die too. Just ask the Neverborn. They thought they couldn't be touched either. Thought they were invincible. They were wrong. Of course, you would know all this seeing as how you've been desecrating yourself with enemies of the gods. He pulled the sword out of Wilka's hand and placed its edge at his throat where it started to burn with pure white flame. I doubt your hide is tougher to cut through than theirs. Shall we put it to the test? Wilkas pulled the sword away from his throat and smiled. That's true, but I don't intend to tell you what my weaknesses are. He shrugged. But fine, you may hold on to the Susan for now if it makes you feel better. It'll be mine soon enough anyway. He walked back towards the sarcophagus. But, as I said, make yourself comfortable. Now we play the waiting game. Waiting for what? And where's the boy? He's around, and we're waiting for my daughter to come back with a new heart. She won't be coming back, Yinrai said. By now she's been caught. If you think I'm powerful, you haven't met my daughter. I've tamed death itself, she's proof of that. Yinrai struggled to keep his anger under control. He sheathed Susano. Death is the natural end of all things, he said. Anything that goes contrary to that is a perversion. Don't be so cynical, young lad. Life and death are ruled by laws. Like with all laws, they can be broken, circumvented and rewritten. All you have to do is to know how. He shrugged. Death doesn't have to be the natural end of all things. Maybe one day, death itself is the perversion. Maybe one day, but not today. Jinrai focused some of the little remaining essence he had into his eyes. He didn't have any illusions about getting out of this situation alive and he wanted to see what his enemy actually was before the end. He could see sorcerer's power oozing from the mandala and the hearts in the center of the chamber. He watched how the invisible darkness oozed from Wilkas and his artifacts to join with the darkness around them. He watched how the surrounding darkness embraced every nook and cranny of the chamber to follow up along its dome-like ceiling and faintly spiral out before it could be joined. He felt his own sorcerer's power spiral downwards from above the ceiling to negate the darkness that tried to spiral upwards. He knew exactly where it was. I do want to get one thing straight though. I don't want you dead because of some natural order or anything silly like that. I don't care about you seeking immortality. I'm much more simple than that. I want to kill you because you pissed on everything our order stands for. You broke every oath you ever took. You betrayed your brothers. You defiled the red of your robes with the blood of the innocents you swore to protect. The men in the mountain are meaningless. The oaths are meaningless. My brothers were meaningless. The red robe is meaningless. The innocents are meaningless. His grip around this scepter tightened. Everything in this world is meaningless as it is right now. But I've stood at the feet of the enemies of the gods. I have looked into the depths of the void. The enemies of the gods were the creators of this world. They were the ones who wrote the laws of nature, who gave things life and who created death. They were the ones who created the gods themselves. He smiled. When I went to hell, I stood before the Ebon Dragon, an entity older than the world itself. I learned then that reality as we know it is an illusion. I learned that everything can be altered, everything can be changed. All the lives I've taken are meaningless to the ones who can create worlds. And that's what I intend to do when I've acquired enough power. I will create a new world where there is no death, where everything is perfect and at peace. He looked at Jinrai. How can you call that evil? Life isn't meaningless, not to me. Every life has meaning, has purpose. I see now why the gods rose up against your failed masters. It's because they think like you do. People are not playthings. They aren't to be used for your demented fantasy, your sick dream, your perfect world. It's never going to happen. The Solar Exalted will stop you. Wilkas shook his head. The Solar Exalted won't stop me, because I'm going to be one of them. That's why you're here. You see, I need to complete the seven-pointed star in order to possess you, not some silly little boy. Jindrai snorted. You have three, you need four more. You really think you'll able to hold me for that long? You think my friends won't find me before then? He tapped Susan. You think I won't kill you before then? You're leaving a lot of chance. It's possible that they will find us, yes, but I have been busy raising zombies and the darkness will alert me of their coming. I'm not too worried. I also don't think you're stupid enough to try to kill me. You don't know how to kill me and you wouldn't get far. He smiled. Also, you need to be a willing host to become a host. 
four days should be enough to break you down physically and mentally until you reach a point where you're begging for me to possess you. Jinrai laughed uproariously. Zombies? Zombies won't even slow them down, they'll just be pissed when they get there. And you'll never be able to get me to consent, my hate for you and all that you stand for is just too much, far too much. As for not being able to kill you, well, I am a solar of the twilight cost, it was my kind that created the techniques that laid your masters low. I'm sure I can figure you out. I have all the time I need to study you. He held up three fingers. You have three days, less if my friends find me first. In three days I will kill you, right in the center of the star. Three days it is then, the boy said. It looks like you got the raw end of some deal, Jinrai told him. Having to change bodies like that, I don't know why you would change to a child's body though, why not get an older one, he smiled. Who doesn't want to feel how it is to be a child again, young, healthy and energetic? Before I got this body I was old enough to be your great grandfather. And being a child is useful in many ways, grown ups have an instinct to care for them, people don't see you as a threat. Look at your friend Tom for example, he opened his home to me and I didn't even need to say a word. Killing that woman and burning down the orphanage was an error on your part. You should have got the hearts before we were on to you. Yes, that was a complication. She had good instincts, that woman. She felt something wasn't quite right and I had to silence her. Sometimes the puzzle pieces don't fall the way you want them to, unfortunately. You made another unfortunate miscalculation. Yinrai said as he stood up and took a few steps into the chamber. If you want my body as your host, you cannot afford to even injure me too severely. I'm sure that even if I walk out from here, you won't attack me. Wilkas looked at him for a moment before shrugging, to which Yinrai smiled. Take care, Wilkas. I will see you again in three days. He headed for the exit. Carmen took a glass of white wine and raised it to her face, but she didn't just gulp it down, instead she rolled it around in the glass like a professional taster, aerating and teasing out its flavors. She poked in her nose and sniffed deeply, sighed happily and finally took a small delicate sip. Ah, she said, after a long moment of letting it sit on her tongue. Good soil, good manure, good casks, no corners cut here. I don't often get a vintage like this, citrus, broad flavors, almost velvety. A little springy mischievous bit at the end, she's a clever one. Who's clever? The wine, Carmen said, winking mysteriously. She has a clever spirit. Odin chuckled and tasted it again. Well, she's trying to get me drunk, so she might have something clever planned. He scooped a little closer to Carmen. So, who is this Carmen I've been hearing so much about? Surely there's more to the fearsome anathema who came to Rosalia in shackles and ended up friends with the queen than the rumors on the street. I don't know, what do the rumors say about this fearsome anathema? Something about saving the queen, but more importantly that she has a foul mouth. Carmen barked out a laugh. Lies, my teeth are perfect. She gave him a wolfish white grin. But my tongue has a filthy fucking disposition. Odin laughed. You're very unlike Rianni. One wouldn't really think of the two of you as compatible friends because of how different you are. I used to be very close to her when we were younger, but we drifted apart. Friends? Carmen swirled her wine in the glass. I guess we don't really hang out together, but she's worth a lot of respect. She's strong, but she needs to learn to relax. She needs a lover, frankly, but she might explode the instant she kissed from all the built-up tension. Odin nodded, smiling faintly. I've heard my father mentioning that Lord Gerard Everstone has propositioned him about arranging a marriage between Rihanna and myself. I don't really favor the idea though and she doesn't seem to like me very much nowadays. It would be a loveless marriage, awkward at best. Carmen scrunched up her nose. Arranged marriages are shite, that's how it's done in Alba Silva, it's stupid there and stupid here, don't sell your life for a few heads of cattle. They kept eating for a while, enjoying the courses as they came. When it was about time to move out, only leaned back in the cushions. Still no Riani, he said. 
It must be calm still. Sated and mildly intoxicated, Carmen nodded back with a blissful smile. I don't mind that she hasn't shown up yet. Had you all to myself, if just for an evening. She belched, lightly blushed, and stood and smoothed off the skirt. Ahem. Rihanna's arms were crossed, her eyes closed as she loomed over the table. She wasn't wearing an arm at the moment, having instead donned a crimson grey sleeveless wool jacket tied around matching wide leg pants with a thick black leather belt. An ornate shield was embroidered over her back and decorated with small ruby fragments. She had some subtle makeup as well with a lipstick only a few shades deeper than a natural color and some grey shadows painted over her eyes. As it so happens, I need to get myself looking respectable too to not stand out, and such things take time. Soon after Jindra had left the chamber and walked into the dark catacomb corridors, he could hear some very reminiscent footsteps behind him. They sounded like that shadow abomination from before. He groaned. Of course it wouldn't be that easy. Wilkas talked a big game, but the truth was that if he let Jinra go, it would cause a myriad of problems for him. Jinra looked down the corridor. It wasn't far to where he needed to go, but he knew the monster chasing him would run him down before he got to the exit. He would have to stand and fight. Again. Last time hadn't gone that well, but Jinra could admit that he had gone about it the wrong way. He checked his surroundings. The corridor would be rather tight for the abomination, so that was good, and there weren't any other shadow creepers around to punch him in the back of the head. He drew Susan and slammed the blade into the ground in front of him before pulling out his talisman of 10,000 eyes. Noble Eagle of War, I call upon you once more. The talisman flared red, blue and gold as the man in the mountain focused his power through it. The temperature of the corridor rose a few degrees as Jinra conjured forth flame from the essence of creation. A servant of darkness bears down upon me with ill intent. You will be my sword to strike down the shadow. The corridor brightened as the flames coalesced into a pair of wings on Jinra's back. He stood firm and listened as the footsteps grew louder with the approach of his foe. Jinra watched patiently as the abomination charged toward him. That's it. Just a bit closer. Close enough. He reached down and turned Susan like a key, lighting up the corridor with sunlight as a golden mandala formed around the abomination. Ethereal chains rose and wrapped around the creature, restricting its movements and holding it in place as Jinra imposed his will upon it. I call upon the will of the Most High, from which all authority flows. Be still, enemy of the sun, and face judgment. The creature let out a howl, potent enough to pulp flesh and pulverize bone. The catacombs trembled from the sound, and Jinra could feel his eardrum throbbing. He held up Zeus on a high and wrapped the blade with his fist. Instead of the ring of steel, there was a boom of thunder that attempted to cancel out the shattering howl. Cracks appeared in the surrounding walls as the two waves of sounds clashed together. While Jinra managed to deflect much of the sound, his thunder didn't wield enough power to cancel it out completely, and it caused him to lose focus for a second and stumble a bit from side to side. The monster, though still trapped in the mandala, howled once more. This time Jinra knew what was coming and could deflect the sound more effectively. He drew more essence from the surroundings and lifted his hands into the air. A garden bird formed above him, surging into being from his efforts. Its fiery wings beat the air furiously, raising the temperature by a significant number of degrees and turning the corridor into a cooking oven. The bird's wild eyes locked onto the abomination, let out a piercing shriek, shaking the walls and filling the catacombs with a cry of war. Almost there, Jinrai said as parts of the ceiling began to crumble and fall. The beast howled again, but it was drained out by the might of the Garda. Finally, Jinrai yelled as the Garda had grown in size, now completely filling the corridor with its bulk. Rivulets of melted stone ran down the walls where the bird's wingtips had brushed up against it. Fly, noble soul of the Garda, let your burning spirit reduce the enemies of light to ash. Flight of the brilliant raptor. The Garda flew forward at incredible speed, heading straight for the abomination. The monster let out a roar as it caught fire from the impact of the bird, and black smoke started to evaporate from its body. It tried to shake off the flames, but it didn't work. Trying to ignore the pain, it regained its footing and threatened Jinra with another war. But Jinra stood impassively. No, I will not flee, not again, not from you. The creature was angry, very angry, but Jinra stood fast. As the creature let out an unshattering roar, Jinra swung at it with Susano causing another boom of thunder as the blade echoed his monster's defiance. 
The blast was strong, pushing Jinrai back several feet, but he could feel the monster weakening. He raised his arms again. Once more! Some of the flames eating away at the abomination flew towards Jinrai, coalescing again into another furious god about, I will burn you into nothing, not even ashes will be left. The creature could sense how the mandala was weakening and it prepared to charge through the corridor, but Jinrai saw this as well and he would have to try to force the Garda bird into completion before the entrapments broke. Let this be the end, flight of the brilliant raptor! The Garda rushed forward with talons outstretched, ready to end the flight and just as the chains loosened enough for the creature to rush out of the flames, the Garda's impact exploded into a new burst of flame that incinerated the abomination and evaporated smoke like body. The dark catacomb was lit up by the flames, it sucked the air out of the corridor though and smoke had built up. Jinrai covered his mouth and nose with his robe and turned to sprint. He knew that there had to be stairs leading up nearby since the chamber where Rilke's hid was directly underneath the temple. He took a right followed by a left down the hallway then to a right again. Where was the way up? He heard the guttural moans before he saw them. There weren't any torches lit here right now and Jinrai had more than once missed the spiderweb that could caught in his face. He knew he was close to the surface now since he could see some of the night sky trickle through the cracks in the ceiling and some snow had managed to get into the floor down there. But before him was a chamber filled to the brim with zombies newly risen from the graves. He had to get past them before he could reach the stairs to the temple. In the next episode, Carmen and Rihanna will continue the hunt for the killer. Jinrai earlier said to Wilkas that zombies wouldn't even slow his friends down. The question now is if the same applies to himself, and that's something we'll find out in the next episode as well. If the Solars can reunite, what Jinrai has learned could be a huge blow to Wilkas. Not only would they know about his plan, but also the location of his base of operations. It's been almost a year since I posted the previous chapter of the series. I try to do this one more elaborately, kind of like an audiobook. I know that I'm not the best at doing the voices, but I hope you enjoyed it anyway. If you liked this video and want to see more, make sure to like, comment, share and subscribe. Also make sure to visit me on Patreon and Twitter and check out the Crystal Feather on the Storyteller's Vault. Until next time, to be continued. There